I got a few questions this week about kind of like motivation psychology stuff, which I know you and I love talking about. Dash may ask, what what do you do? What do y'all do when you don't feel like making music or dislike what you're making? Um, Great question. Which I, I love that question because I think it, the the important thing to realize is we all feel it. Sometimes, a lot of the time, some of the best people I know don't like anything they do. I think the vast majority of things, especially as a as a producer and a writer, I think mostly the stuff I make isn't very good. It's not to say I can't enjoy things that I do. And when I make something that's really great or I'm really, I'm involved with something with a collaboration with a lot of other people, I get really excited and I, I go, yeah. man, this is so great. I'm so happy. Um, and that's part yeah. of what keeps me going. I mean, it's kind of like comedians talk about it, especially in the, you know, most comedians when they're, first five or 10 years of their career, you're still bombing a lot of the time. And you get through the times when you're bombing because when you kill, it's the greatest feeling in the world. And I feel like production's the same way where it's like, I'm like stressing and losing my mind. Everything sounds terrible. And then sometimes when it sounds amazing, I just go, this is the greatest feeling I've ever had. And yeah. how, do you, how do you get through those times? And you as a mixer, but also as a producer and writer and other things, how do you think about when you're not feeling it, when you're not excited, either, you know, you pre- you don't deal with a lot of things these days where you're mixing something you actively don't like. Although a couple of weeks ago we talked about it, you were yeah. you ended up mixing something and you were you were doing something. You're like, I, I should have said no to this, and we've talked yeah. about that. But but when you're in it, especially when you're starting out, you're doing a lot of things you're not necessarily in love with all the time. How do that you- that example was um, they wound up using the rough mix on that one, so I mm. should have said no. Um, yeah. I thought the producer was happy with it and, and we got it across the line, but that will exist on the, I think le- slightly less than handful of records this year that they're going to use the rough. And I can say that the three or four of those that that turned out to be the case have all been ones that I probably should have said no to and didn't really enjoy working on. Yeah. Now that being said, I can normally find something I like about the mix Something that I remember um, listening to Manny speak about on, I think it was Pinsato's place, where he said, if I don't like the record, maybe I like the snare. And I focus in on that snare. You know, like I find a new inspiring sound that I like in that record that, you know, I can rely on that at least giving me some auditory pleasure (laughs) as I go down. So I'm on that school of things. Um, like Like you said, though, I'm in a I'm at a position where I like most of the high majority of what I'm working on. I can get into when it's something I'm not enjoying. It's usually a difficulty at play and not a out of my comfort zone difficulty. Like usually battling the, the loud rough we're talking about. That's just so obnoxious. And I just know they're not going to like it. Uh, That's the only time I get pure non enjoyment. And I take breaks. I mean, I always talk about breaks. We've talked about an earlier episode. We've talked about a lot. A lot. I just go away. I'll I'll, I'll put um, a podcast on. I'll go for a walk. I'll meditate. I'll I'll do my workout later in the day. I'll do a second bike ride. I'll. There's so many other things to do to take quick perspective breaks to get through it. Um, but really, I think that there's got to be a judgment call early on if you enjoy the the piece of music that's presented to you to work on. I remember getting uh, a guitar or a piano and vocal songs and I was a producer, as I'm sure you're, you're um, well-versed in. And I, I say yes because of an opportunity, but then I actually hear, I've said yes and now the session's in front of me and I'm like, well, what do I actually do with this record? There's a million ways it can go. So here's my way. And I, you know, maybe I do a half time, but then like the double time dance version wins of the record, but I hear it more emotionally. Like, did I have, uh, did I enjoy the time working on it? Sure. But did I enjoy the outcome of it because I feel let down because I didn't, you know, the expectations of it going through and you didn't know two other producers are working on it. And there's, yeah. there's a lot of variability there. Uh, I think make a discerning judgment and conversation with the people before. And we talked about this last week where I disagreed with you about you saying yes to everything to a degree on the come up. Um, yeah. And kind of, and then we kind of, I think you kind of sided with me to a degree uh, after explaining it, because I think the closer we get to understanding what we're good at and where we're at, and of course we have to say yes to things for other reasons, but the closer we get to saying no earlier, the less of this will, um, you know, will will encounter. And again, still, you know, 17, 18 years into this, the times I least enjoy it are when I know gut 
the gut said to say no earlier. I think, yeah, you said something. I, I, I think I agree with you. The, you said something earlier about finding something in the process that you can enjoy, something to hold on to, something to anchor you. Yeah. It's something Eric Valentine talked about a lot when I was coming up with him, where you know, if you're producing a band and maybe it's not your favorite thing, but look, you got to work, you got to eat, you got to you got to do your thing. You're producing a band. Yeah. Well, try to make the dopest guitar sounds you've ever heard. Try to make yeah. the greatest drum thing. Try to make the biggest chorus downbeat hit. You know, you're talking about rock bands at the time, but like, yeah. you know, if you're if you're if you're working on things that you don't love, it's a challenge. I mean, and and this is something that that you and I get into a lot, which is the thing that separates the really top level people from the, like the tier or two below is very rarely or a small percentage pure skill. It yeah. really is about professionalism, being able to be consistent, being able to get things done. I guarantee that some of the hits that Serban has made, he's not sitting there being like, this is my jam on the 17th mix revision. No, but he does it and he does it with a smile and he's great to deal with. And, yeah. you know, I was, I was telling some of the other day, there was something I worked on with him years ago where you know mix revision 15 the note was turn the guitars up you know a db and a half and then mix revision Oof. 18 was turn the guitars down a db and a half back to where they were yeah and that's hard just, that's a hard that's, one but that's that's part of the gig and it's part you know, of the you, gig you, you got to be able to anchor yourself on on something and you know in that situation i think the answer is take breaks and make sure you're working on other things you love and jump between yeah. things if you want. I mean, that's one of the ways that I, um, and, and I think you do it a bit too, when, where one of my favorite things to do is to be working on multiple productions at the same time. Because yeah. if you get stuck in one sound and one palette and one place over and over, um, it makes it hard to break out of that. Even if I go do a push up or walk around the block or meditate or have a snack or whatever, to be able to go between songs and try different things, even if I'm, That's only, a getting huge part. On, if I'm only getting paid on one project, it's still great to have other things to, yeah. uh, to be able to bounce my brain off of. That's a really um, good one. That's a really good one. Um, I don't, that's, that's every day. Uh, for me, so um, I, I guess I forget that that's the best way to do it. Where actually, I I try my best to not let deadline decide what I work on, and let inspiration decide what I work on. Which I think we talked about a few weeks ago, um, or I've talked about a lot. Which is sometimes some records are nighttime records for me, and some are daytime or morning records for me. So. I know at night I'm going to be in a certain type of mood, so I'm going to mix this maybe slower record or maybe a more, um, uh, you know, a, a deeper uh, a deeper record, a more moody record, something I can really dive into the 3D landscape of. And maybe the morning I'm going aggressive pop and a little bit more like up-tempo, up upbeat. And if I'm not feeling that, I always have the other one to jump on. But I let that dictate where I'm at. And I always jump back and forth. Sometimes it's actually more interesting to do notes before I bounce a mix. So I'll do a mix for something. I feel that vibe. And I'm like, cool, this is tight. But I got notes for four other songs to do real quick. So I'll spend an hour doing those notes and then come back to the song to take a break. So that's a really good point of having different production styles to work on different artists in a mix process, different songs, different artists. We're kind of always doing that unless you're it's really rare these days to be zoomed in on one project for extended amount of time unless you're in like that that lockdown uh, songwriting world where you're just, you're, you know, you're just throwing colors at the canvas for two months in a house because it's got yeah. a COVID lockdown. And, you know, obviously that happens, but it, that's not really my world. So I, I do love that aspect of it. I don't think about that very much. That's why that wasn't my first reaction to your question or to the question, but that is the best way to do it for me. 